The mission is being defined under resolute support as success of the Afghans. The long-term impact of this mission, you know, if you define success as Afghan success under resolute support, is really the inability to, to personally touch that, because uh, I don't spend a lot of time interacting with the Afghans. Your mission here in Afghanistan is pretty non-traditional for an infantry division. Yes, you have security, but you're doing an awful lot of logistics. Divisions play a large role in logistics even back at home. You know, division's role was really a resourcing headquarters. So it's, prior, you know, allocating and prioritizing resources, which is not much different than what we do over here. It, it's not the type of mission I'm used to when I'm deployed because of the logistics focus, but it's not something that is abnormal for a division headquarters. So your primary focus is on the drawdown? Really, it's U.S. forces, the day-to-day -day is, is U.S. forces support across all classes of supply. Then we'll get to the drawdown piece. People are the easy part. People get on an airplane, they fly away. It's, it's all of the equipment and the infrastructure, and all that equipment and infrastructure represents missions. So it's the sequencing of when missions end, how you get soldiers out, and really when you get soldiers out, and then all of the equipment that goes along with those soldiers. But Afghanistan is still a dangerous place. Oh, absolutely. It's still an area of active hostilities. You still get hit with rockets and IEDs? Lots of rockets, um, IEDs out in uh, you know the, the ground defense area around Bagram. We've had a couple RPGs shot at helicopters. Uh, we've been direct fire attacks a couple times since we've been here. It's much lower than it, than it used to be, uh, but we're getting into the middle, uh, beginning of fighting season now. So that, that will pick up eight um, December, highest number of rocket attacks ever against Bagram. Uh, so it's still, it is still an area of active hostilities and it's still a, a dangerous environment. Fighting season is upon us. This year, the Afghans will be taking on the fight by themselves. Do you have confidence in them keeping you secure? Um, good and getting better. So what I have outside the wire really to suppress the rockets is uh, I've got a Georgian battalion and a Czech company. Partnered with the Afghans in the lead, uh, there's one company really from the 201st Corps, then a, a MP battalion, Afghan MP battalion that works with the Georgians. And the Afghans have never really worried about the area around Bagram because there's always been a large U.S. presence here and we've taken care of it for them. But the Afghan government realizes this is their responsibility. So there has been a cipher, uh, an order came out from the Ministry of Defense that told Afghan units they are responsible for security of specifically airfields throughout the country. So I'm not getting pushed back on, you know, getting the Afghans out and getting the Afghans to do what they need to do. It's just a skill level thing right now. So that's, that's why we're investing a lot of time and effort into increasing their skill and their capability of doing it. Is the Bagram footprint still changing? Oh yeah. So we're down to about 17,000. One time it was 23, 24, 25,000. We've knocked down 1,200 wooden structures. We've got about 1,000 more to go. The last time you were here, there was probably, in, in the retrograde yards, it was probably completely full of, of stuff waiting to be retrograded. As you drive around this time, they're almost empty. And then you have to make the assumption to say we're where we need to be, that we had accountability of everything. And that wasn't true either. So we're still finding stuff that's come over here over the last 13 years, sitting in the dark corners of fobs that uh, nobody really knew it was there. So, I mean, we're continuing to push stuff out as best we can. The, all the repair parts sitting here at Bagram was really scoped for about a 50,000 soldier presence, so we're bringing that down. The central issue facility, uniforms, and everything else was really scoped for about a 50 or 60,000 soldier footprint, so we're continuing to get that out. And, and all that's just designed to make the job next year, now that this announcement's been made, easier when it's time to get everything out. So. You describe things that are going along fairly well, but this is Afghanistan. Nothing is simple. What is your greatest struggle? Well, my number one focus is, is security of this place, Bagram, and really the safety of the people here on Bagram. The inability to, to really get out and, and prosecute targets inside the GDA from a, a pure U.S. standpoint makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, although our Afghan partners on the Afghan Special Forces side have done a phenomenal job the last four months prosecuting targets. What about the Afghan people that live in the communities around Bagram? Do you get a sense from them? How do they feel about this continuing drawdown? 
There's a little bit of angst right now. You know, as Bagram gets smaller, we obviously need less, need to employ less local Afghans. Um, so they're convinced that we're firing local Afghans more than we need to. And so that's kind of a constant reinforcement of, of you know, the, the employment we provide. They're all convinced we're going to be here for a very long time. And I keep telling them we're leaving, you know, at the end of 2016, and, and none of them believe me that we're leaving at the end of 2016. Bagram has had such a positive impact on the economy of Parwan and Bagram District. I, I think it's, it has had such a positive impact for such a long time. I don't think people really realize what this does for the, the local economy here in the area. Uh, I don't get a lot of complaints about noise. I don't get a lot of complaints about aircraft taking off and, and landing. I think they're probably just used to it by this time. It's a very cooperative, uh, great governor, the Peacock is doing a pretty good job. New commander of the Provincial Security Unit here in PAR-1. New commander out at the prison. The team is right and the cooperation is there. You describe an Afghanistan that is moving forward and yet you read the headlines and there are suicide bombers, there are IEDs, there is corruption, mm -hmm. uh, there are still political cabinets that have not been filled. Uh, the success of this mission will be defined by the Afghans and how well we do to prepare them to maintain their own security long term. So are there still suicide bombings? Absolutely. You know, the Taliban right now um, are killing uh, Afghan security forces, but for the most part they're killing Afghan civilians. And, and I think the Afghan civilians are starting to, or already have started to, realize that that's what's going on. There's not a lot of Afghan people that are looking forward to having the Taliban come back and take over. Daesh, ISIL, ISIS, uh, they're here. The Taliban are very nervous about ISIS in Afghanistan uh, because insurgent groups in, in Afghanistan for a very long time have operated under the, under the authority of the Taliban. Of course, the ISIS, aren't play, ISIS is not playing that game. So there's actually some infighting between ISIS and Taliban. So how do you sum this up? at this point in your deployment? From a U.S. 4A, you know, deputy commander support for General Campbell, it really comes down to how well we set up uh, next year, next calendar year, for the eventual drawdown and retrograde. This will be an interesting fighting season. It's a very interesting, fight, or it's a very important fighting season uh, for President Ghani and CEO Abdullah. I think if they come out of this fighting season and it's seen as the Afghans have lost this fighting season, I think the next three years of his presidency is going to get very little done. I think the Afghans have a real chance to do well this fighting season. We'll lose some ground temporarily, but I think when the Afghans take it, try to go to take it back, uh, they will quickly take it back and hold it. There are challenges, there continue to be challenges in Afghanistan. And I'm focused a little bit differently now, personally, as the Resolute Support Commander compared to when I was here last time. I'm dealing at the, a different level with President Ghani, Dr. Abdullah. So for me personally, the challenges are dealing with the National Unity Government, ensuring that they continue to move forward. They've got to put a cabinet in place, they've got to make some changes in leadership, they've got to hold people accountable. But at the same time, what Resolute Support is doing is really prioritizing some of the things that we can train, advise, and assist on with a lower number of people here, lower number of resources, and trying to maintain what we've established over the last 13 or 14 years and build upon that. I think what we're able to do with Resolute Support is to be able to continue to train, advise, and assist at the core level and then at the ministry level, and then do only at the tactical level with the Special Operating Forces. I think we're making progress here, but again, the National Union Government and what they do at that level to continue to move forward depends a great deal on what they do. I've heard the mission described as a way to validate, to verify our investment here for the last 14 years. What we're trying to do is continue to work with the Afghan partners. We knew for a long time as we took a look at when we would be uh, starting to reduce uh, the number of forces that we had here that there would be gaps and seams that we'd need to continue to build upon. Those are in the aviation, close air support, intelligence, logistics, special operating forces. We went to eight essential functions that really takes a look at areas that they need to continue to develop so they can sustain the force that we've built over time here. Programming, planning, budgeting, execution is one of our essential functions. Transparency, accountability, oversight, rule of law, force generation, intelligence, strategic communications, those type of things we've got to continue to work on at the ministry level and at the core level. Are they receptive? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think the, the Afghan leadership understands how, how important those are to continue to move forward. They have taken on this fight. I mean, they own the security of their country. Uh, it's time for them to do that. They're ready. They've done that. The fighting season has begun. There's been suicide bombs. Uh, there's been an insider attack, the loss of a life of a U.S. soldier. Afghanistan remains a dangerous place. We've been told that this is the year where the Afghan security forces will stand and fight on their own. Will they be enough? Yeah, I think they understand how important this fighting season is, uh, that they are on their own, they do have the lead. Look, look, I mean, the Taliban doesn't have up armored Humvees, it doesn't have MRAPs, it doesn't have D-30 howitzers, it doesn't have MI-17 version 5 helicopters, it doesn't have a couple MI-35s, it doesn't have the technology that the Afghan security forces have, it doesn't have the weaponry. There's no way that the Taliban are going to take over Afghanistan. I don't fear for, for Kabul being overrun by, by the Taliban. Uh, the Afghan security forces understand they have the lead for security. They want that lead. They are a sovereign country. Are you going to have suicide vest bombers? Are you going to have a magnetic ID placed on a bus inside of Kabul with a city of five million people? Yes, it's going to happen. But for every one of those magnetic IDs that goes on a bus, you, what you don't hear about is the 10 that they stopped. There's a lot of good news story going on in Afghanistan. The issue is getting that out and making sure people understand uh, what they do. Will there continue to be challenges? Yeah, yes. I mean, this is a very, very dangerous country. It's only known war for the last 35 plus years. Yeah, but President Ghani and Dr. Brule with this national union government have the confidence of the people. 85% of the nation is underneath and voted for the national union government. So it's time now for the Taliban, the insurgents, to come back into the political process. It's Muslims killing Muslims. Why are they doing that? You know, they got to come into the political process. And President Ghani, Dr. Abdullah are really trying to work that hard. Okay, so you're talking about security for Kabul, but what about outside of Kabul? Will that be secure? Yeah, I mean, the governance piece is a huge issue. So if you're in a, if a, a small, remote village way up in Kunar someplace and you don't have any governance, you know, you're going to look to uh, what is going to provide you that. In many of those cases, uh, the insurgents out there are the only ones out there that may have the ability through force, through putting fear in people's hearts, that provide uh, some sort of governance for them. They do very well on the information warfare, getting their news out in the media saying, hey, we attacked this. 85 percent of the civilians killed are killed by the Taliban. Uh, the support from the people of Afghanistan for the Taliban is less than 10 percent. To have an insurgency, you need the support of people. And we just see that continue to go down. You know, the, the Afghan people want the same things we do. They want a roof over their head. They want to be able to provide for the family. Uh, they want a job. The Taliban don't offer, the, offer that. The Afghan government has to do a better job of reaching out to some of these remote areas. But I think, again, they're going to continue to work that very hard. Now, what about the Afghan local police? Is that still a valid program? The Afghan local police were designed to provide security for that village. They're not trained, manned, or equipped like the Army or the regular police. They don't have the weaponry. But they are designed to have the trust and confidence of the senior elders of that village and provide sort of a defensive for that village. The problem we've had in the last year or so, they put them outside of the village, they put them farther away, and they don't have mutually supporting positions. And so they become very easy, soft targets for the Taliban to attack. And consequently, their uh, casualty rate was the highest. Sir, I've spoken to U.S. and coalition soldiers over the last few days, and they all say that this is the time for the Afghan security forces to step up and own the fight. Yeah, no, absolutely. They want to do that. They understand that the, the coalition has been downsized. We don't have 120, 140,000 folks here like we did a couple years ago. So they have to own it. It's a sovereign country. They want to protect their people. They have the technology. In most cases, they have the training. They've got to have the confidence. They have to have the leadership. You know, leadership and then holding people accountable is what I tell President Ghani and Dr. Dula they need to really focus on. 88% of the people support the Afghan security forces. It's the number one trusted institution in the Army for Afghanistan. The police is in the 70 percentile range. A couple years ago, I would tell you that wouldn't have been, that would not have happened. Their air force, their special operating forces continues to grow. Their special operating forces are probably the best in the region. They continue to work hard. Again, they get the right leadership. They continue to hold people accountable. they got to get after the corruption. The recent operation in Helmand has been held as a success. They killed their enemies. They gathered up their weapons. They chased the bad guys away. Will they be able to hold? Yeah, well, this is a great, uh, great example of what we think the future is going to be in Afghanistan. Police, Army, or intel forces, or aviation, the special operating forces, all working together. It was very complex. It involved three different corps. They were very methodical in how they went about this. I think they were very successful in meeting the objectives that they had set for themselves. 
But the key will be, will they be able to hold that as they move forward? And that's what the people will take a look at. I think they've made some adjustments in their structure. They worked a lot with the district governors and the people and really tried to get at uh, community policing in some of those areas. So I think time will tell, but I think they had a lot of focus and a lot of things they put together for this. And we'll see. The focus of the Train Advisors His mission is to help develop and solidify their systems and procedures. Advisors that I've spoken to have said that they've also had to learn how to say no. It is time now for them to have the lead. They have the lead. They want the lead. So as we look at it, so for instance, uh, I get asked, hey, well, we need close air support. Okay, so what have you done for yourself? You know, have you used your own MI-17s? Have you used your own MI-35s? Have you fired your own howitzers? You know, have you put a quick reaction force out there? I don't have a lot of that to provide to them. What we do provide, though, is the training piece and the advising piece. So General Campbell, from the American perspective, what's the end game? Well, I think from the American perspective, what they have now is a national union government that is a willing partner as they look toward the future. President Ghani is going after corruption. He's trying. He is a commander in chief. He's taken the the Afghan security forces underneath his wing. He's looking forward to moving forward and making sure that Afghanistan is a stable, secure environment for for citizens. He's engaging the region, whether it's Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, China, India, Iran. I think the American people ought to know they've made a big difference here. People ask me, is it worth it? I, I tell them absolutely. And if you take a look at any of the measurable statistics, whether it's roads, cell phones, life expectancy, people in school, teachers, jobs, on and on, those numbers continue to go up. And without security, and without the sacrifice for our men and women, you know, it wouldn't have been there. If you look around the rest of the world, uh, it's a pretty dangerous and complex place. And Afghanistan has an opportunity to be a stabilizing factor. It will continue to be dangerous. But with a government in place now that's moving forward uh, with a president that has a vision to make sure that it is a country that is stable and takes care of its people, and for a small investment for our continued future, this can be the stable area for, for this part of the world for a long time. And then one final question. We've seen a lot of advances over the years. Are they at the point where there's no turning back? They will keep progressing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we're there. They'll, they'll continue to move forward, but they have to be able to get after the, the economic issues that they have in this country. So they got to get the cabinet in place. They can't afford the army and the police they have today. They're very dependent upon donor nations. We have 41 countries tied into resolute support. So President Ghani understands that. And he's working very hard with all the regional countries to move forward. I think we have to give that opportunity to, to work.